I'm Carol Johnstone. I'm a senior accelerator scientist at Fermilab, but because this is a private conference, a private company conference, I, I can't use my DOE affiliation. So that's why I also have a small company. So that's why I use my company as my affiliation at this point. And let me warn you, this is the first time I've given this talk. So I hope you'll be, I hope I am clear enough in giving it. So the motivation for this, when they started talking to me is that the design of accelerators are still in the dark ages. We do not use modern design algorithms. We have a small sort of cobble of accelerator designers that are experienced and they sort of know the tricks of the trade. And then we throw something together and then we give it to some of our advanced modeling codes to tell us if the machine works. So one of the things that I did with Mathematica and it started very early on when I started designing some colliders and some very elaborate machines for high energy physics, I began to realize I really needed some sort of systematic approach or some sort of ability to design an accelerator, a modern accelerator that didn't rely on a handful of handwritten equations. And so to introduce you to accelerator design, it is actually somewhat simple, the concept and concept. You're taking a beam, you have two problems in designing a stable accelerator. One is you have to hang on to the transverse beam envelope. You have to group the particles together and then you have to push them through a set of optics. And the optics are almost identical to light optics. And so that makes it sort of a very easy problem to explain to most physicists. And second, if you're designing, particularly an accelerator, a circular accelerator, there is a reference orbit. And in a conventional accelerator, the reference orbit is defined by a constant magnetic field. And that reference orbit in a circular accelerator a particle that is on the reference orbit always retraces its steps, turn by turn by turn. So when you, the accelerators were originally linear, linear accelerators, and those are very expensive. They're very large footprint. You would like to reuse these magnetic components. You would like to use, reuse your acceleration components. So to make the accelerator affordable. So that became the concept of a circular accelerator. But even a circulator accelerator, you could unbend. And so the transverse beam envelope is independent of your central reference trajectory, okay? So what you have at the top here are a series of what we call quadrupole magnets. Quadrupole magnets are just, it's the darling of accelerator designers because what it does is it focuses the beam envelope and the center, but the center of the, quadrupole magnet is shown on the left, it does not, it has zero field. So it does not affect your reference trajectory. So you're only confining your beam envelope. And what you see atop is in the blue is what we call a horizontally focusing quadrupole. It focuses horizontally. So the beam is large as it goes through a horizontally focusing and then it becomes small as it goes through a horizontally defocusing. So unlike optics, light optics, you can, only, you can only focus in one plane with magnetic optics. So you develop a wave, a wave train, and you see this beam envelope oscillating in the horizontal plane and the exact opposite out of phase is oscillating in the vertical plane. So the idea is you have to hang on to both the vertical plane and you have to hang on to both to the horizontal plane simultaneously. And then you have to close this ring on itself. And so you see a little bit when you start combining the, uh, the different um, elements below, you begin to form a ring. And see if I can show a little bit more. So you begin to see combine the elements. And generally speaking, in a ring, you like to keep your quadrupoles and your dipoles separate. And one of the advances that I'm working on is what happens when you have to combine both? Can you make a much more efficient ring? The other thing that happens, and this is very, is very important for stability. When you develop this wave-like structure in the beam envelope, then that, la that lends itself to phase advance. It's like a sinusoidal wave. So let's start at the middle of this blue, this focusing element. And we've got a particle on the outside. 
Well, he, he kicks it towards the inside. And if, he, if it's got 90 degrees of phase advance, he actually ends up at the inside of the quarter pole when it hits the next focusing quarter pole. And so this wave forms, but this wave, this phase advance is constrained. If there is 180 degrees of phase advance, meaning the particle on the outside, the upper part, ends up at the bottom of the next focusing quarter pole, that is the limit of stability. And so now we have, I'm introducing you to the concept of transverse stability in terms of something we call phase advance. And when you add up the phase advance of each periodic cell, so one cell goes from one element to the next element of the same kind. So from this blue quarter pole to the next blue quarter pole, that is a unit cell. And this is very typical. This is almost universal. And we use these, this type of sort of single lens cells. Okay. So if there's a phase advance of stability in that between about 10 degrees and 180 degrees, the beam is stable. And so that also means the half cell is half of that, the phase advance. The phase advance is a very powerful indicator of stability of an accelerator. So what I do is I design fixed field machines. And a fixed field machine was first invented as a cyclotron. And this is, we're talking circa 1930. And there are two types of cyclotrons. There's something called a separated sector where the magnets are individual. And there's something called an azimuthal varying field. And that just means it's a uniform pole phase that goes in and out, it makes hills and it makes valleys. But it also has an azimuthal curve. And what you see here is on the top is a conventional cyclotron. And on the bottom is the as in AVF cyclotron. And what you have is for stability, this curve goes as a is a radius in exponential. It's an exponential curve. What is this doing for you? So what happens when you cross the edge of this magnet? is that if you cross the edge at an angle, so it's not normal to the edge of the field edge, then one side of the beam is closer to the magnet, the other side of the beam is farther away. And to satisfy Maxwell's equations, the field has to rise slowly up to the pole tip. So what happens is you get a net focusing or defocusing effect. So what happens in this is that this edge crossing actually is the constraining force for the vertical plane. Because in the horizontal plane, you have a bend field. And that bend field, if you go on the outside, you get more of a bend. On the inside, you get less of a bend. So it's naturally focusing in the horizontal plane. But you've got a problem with the vertical plane. And if you want to make these accelerators higher and higher energy, the vertical focusing is related to the field strength. And as you go to high energy, and the cyclotron is predominantly a uniform field, you have to make the angle sharper and sharper and sharper. And that's where you get the exponential curve. But there's a problem with high energy cyclotrons. They can only do this for so long. And then relativistic effects creep in. And this is a very nonlinear pattern in the vertical. So this reference orbit may make it through, but the guy on the inside in the inner radius or a guy on the outside of the radius see a very different edge crossing angle. So eventually the transmission of this machine is limited in the cyclotron. So the cyclotrons ha have not evolved significantly, you know, since the 1930s. They're still pretty much Lawrence's cyclotron. So then it, let, so let's go to modern day machines. Let's, let's do 19, the 1950s. So in the 1950s, they said, well, why can't I add a field gradient? Let's make the vertical envelope see a field gradient. And so in this case, what they do is, but we're still using an algorithm, a, an algorithm that you can write down on paper. And the algorithm is that it's called the scaling law. And here you have a constant B field, but it goes up with radius as a function of the power of K. And so this is called the field index. And the higher the K, the stronger the field becomes at the outer at the outer radii. And so you can go to higher energies with this type of machine. And there are two types of machines. One is something called the radial sector. And you say, well, how do you hang on to the vertical envelope? Well, you just, you take this, which is 
horizontally focusing and you flip the sign of the B field in the next magnet, but you make that magnet small. And so that it's net bend outwards is not as strong as the bend inwards. And here you see the Kyoto University Research Reactor. These are radial sectors, they're, they're nested, uh, but they're very large because you do have a reverse bend to stabilize the vertical tune. There's also something that looks very much like an AVS cyclotron where again, you begin to bend the field. Actually, it went down too far, so I lost it. Okay, I lost, okay. So in here you have, you can actually make, here you have on the right-hand side, the sort of your picture, that is a picture of a spiral sector. And again, that, but that again, you have these nonlinear transverse field components that causes, eventually causes problems. And in the bottom, you actually see the field expansion on the left, you see how it's expanded. And what's interesting to note, and this is one of the advances that I've been working on, is that if you notice that the geometric center of the ring is also the gradient center of the ring. So your multiples, um, okay, I'm all, let me answer questions at the end. So when you, when you do this gradient um, field expansion, you're always hanging on to the geometric center. What if you were to take these field expansions and say, I don't really care where the magnetic center is. I don't, I, would, I don't care it being related to the geometric center. And actually on the right-hand side, you actually see one of the machines that was built recently. This is ERIT, it's actually a neutron spallation. This radial sector has an enormous ability to recapture beam. It has an internal neutron spallation target. It recaptures the beam after going through the target. So it's a very interesting machine, but these are not ISO. These are not isochronous machines, meaning they can't produce a constant beam. The cyclotrons can, in the non, if it's non-relativistic, the cyclotron can produce a constant beam. Because of this scaling law, the scaling law cannot produce a constant beam. It ha has to be swept frequency, meaning the revolution time of the beam varies as a function of energy. And that actually means you chop the beam. So you, it, it comes out in pulses. It does not come out continuously like a cyclotron. So what if you wanted to design a completely arbitrary system and you wanted to give it to a code that could tell you and optimize it for you without you having to write down equations? So, and this is, this is kind of mind boggling and I don't remember how I even derived this, but this has all the parameters that you need to, to describe an arbitrary focusing magnet with a field gradient. You've got injection, you've got extraction, you've got the length of the magnet, you've got the length of the magnet and injection, you've got an arbitrary edge angle. And this edge angle is different from what you're going to, you're gonna let free it up in the defocusing magnet. And the defocusing magnet, you're gonna let the gradient be different. In the, in the scaling FFGAs, fixed field gradient uh, machines, this, was a reflection of the gradient in the focusing magnet. But why do you do that? Why not take this and make this a completely different gradient, strip out the reverse bend, which is a dipole field and does almost nothing for you in terms of optics and make the ring small. So this has all the components, all the variables that you need. It has all the bending radii, it has the bending, it has all the geometric parameterizations. So if you go with it, it's pretty intimidating. So you have to, of course you have to know where you, what you want your machine to do. You have to know where you want to extract and where you want to inject. What is your energy? And that gives you the momentum. It's often relativistic. So on the list, you have a whole list of the bending radii, the edge angles, the drifts. You have to know the drifts between magnets. You have to know how long they are. And you have to know what is the aperture of the magnet. In other words, can you choose the distance from where you extract the beam to where you inject the beam? Very, very critical design parameter. On the right-hand side, you have more of the geometric parameters and uh, the geometric parameters um, are the bend angles. And you have to impose closure. So the bend angle, you can't just say, oh gosh, let's let, let's let the bend angles you know, be free. You can't, you have to close the ring. The reference orbit has to close at injection and it has to close at an extraction. 
there is something called a field gradient, and that's K. That is the derivative of your field. So you have this highly nonlinear field expansion, and you have to take the derivative of it, and that gives you the focusing strength. Okay. And then you have the half length of the magnets. And I'm sorry, what's my stupid alarm going on? So um, then you have the half length of the magnets. So you have to know how big the ring is. Okay. So, so then let's start reducing terms. Let's define an arbitrary field. And this is where you go well beyond what we currently do. No one can handle it. What you do is something called linear dynamics. We know how to solve the equations with a dipole field and a quadrupole field, a linear gradient. The minute you go to sextuple, the minute you go to a squared field in the radius or an octopole field in the radius, then you're out of your league. You can't design, you can't design that with normal dynamics. So you, then you start reducing everything in terms of this field gradient. You know your, you know your field gradient strengths as a function of the derivative of the field. And what's important about this is that I start at extraction. If I started at injection and work my way out to extraction in the field gradient, you're taking a very small value and trying to make it stable at a very large value of the field. So I actually do it backwards. I start with extraction and say, I really want, I know kind of how big this ring is based on conventional magnetic fields. And I want to see how stable I can make it at injection. So I work from the large number down to the small number. And this is, this is something that's not done. And what is also not done is you see that you take, it's delta XEF minus delta XIF. So I start at some arbitrary field point and I come down to where I think the injection should be, but it has no relationship to the geometric center of the ring. And that's something that's hard to, um, accelerator designers get very upset when you tell them that. So what are my machine, what are my constraining equations? What do I need to make this envelope stable? I talked about tune. Well, the tune is actually one of the folk, the focal length is another concept, focal length and phase advance. Focal length is where you go through 90 degrees of phase advance, okay? It's where you cross the reference axis. So you start out with, this is just a thin lens formula. It's the strength of the quadrupole. The next term, is actually the bend angle of the focusing quad divided by its radius. And that actually is a focusing term in the horizontal only. Then you have this edge crossing term, which as I said, if you, if you go normal to the edge, you have no focusing. So you wanna make this edge crossing term favorable in the vertical. And so the vertical doesn't have any bend, body bend but it does have the edge focusing. And then you have the separate magnet that has a very strong defocusing gradient. Okay. And so you define these at injection extraction. And then you have some very complicated geometry and it includes the edge contour. And the first one is you have to impose geometric closure. You have to take the bend angle of each half cell and make it pi over the number of periodic units. So you absolutely have to make the bend to be two pi across the entire ring. But then the because you know your geometry, you've got all your geometry defined, you have some very complex transcendental equations that depend on how far the orbit extursion is, what is the edge angle, what's the distance to the next magnet. And so the geometry is, is really quite tricky. And then you have a lot of interdependent complex dependencies that are, if you know your extraction distance between your two magnets, the distance between the two magnets, then you can use the geometry and work your way back as what is the drift at injection between the two magnets. So now you have something like 10 equations that you have that are very complex, they're transcendental, but it gets better. You can't use these thin lens equations. That's what the actual mathematical formulation of the thick lens is. And actually this is not quite right because I have to this starts out with, in this case, a drift, but I'll, I'll show you why. You can start out with a focusing magnet. You go through at a focusing edge, you go through a drift, you go through another focusing edge, and then you go through the defocusing, and then you go backwards for the entire unit cell. That is related to the tune. So that's, this, is a, this is the standard formulation for the tune. So now you have the trace that gives you the cosine of the tune across the whole cell. 
Now you have a, a reason to impose a stability limit. So this is very difficult in practice if you're, if you're trying to put this in code this, but in Mathematica, it actually becomes fairly simple. And I'll show you the code it makes. Um, and you have to make a few, you have to make a number of rational decisions. You have to know how strong is your magnetic field. So I usually set up the radius and I know what the distance is between magnets that I want at extraction. So I set up a few things and that I, that I want to limit when I start searching on these. And one of the things that I done recently, which is really is what is really advanced the field is I make the rotational time of each orbit identical. So now I'm coming in with a continuous beam like a cyclotron. It never stops. I keep coming and coming and coming. I don't have to pulse the machine. Okay. And to do that, it, you have to make the average radius a function of a ratio of the velocity of the betas, the relativistic velocities. So if you were to actually program this, uh, you would actually set up your matrices and I put some dummy variables in it. I mean, and then these are high, the defocusing magnet in the horizontal plane is a hyperbolic sine and cosine. So you're not just dealing with transcendental equations. You've got the hyperbolic sine and cosine thrown in, okay? And then I set up my uh, matrix multiplications. And this is, this is like trivial, not, I shouldn't say this trivial, it took me a long time. But then I start dumping in what kind of magnet I want and what the focusing is. And I, I dump in the field gradients and stuff. And then I end up with a trace. I end up with something very simple. And it's two times the cosine, the trace is what I want. I want a certain tune for, a pair, for each cell. And then I make the trace of all the matrices that I put in with the field gradients. And then I set it, I subtract off what I want it to be. And then I want to minimize that. I want, I would, ideally you would want this to be zero, but really in practice, if you made it, if you said, I, I want this exactly to be 90 degrees, usually the, the minimizer has trouble. So I now give it, a, in mathematics, it's easy. I give it a range. And this range is, um, so it's 80 degrees to roughly 120 degrees. And then I can put ranges on the radius. So, so here is just some examples of when I sort of fit. Here's, here's an octopole fit. And this is a therapy machine. This is 330 MeV per nucleon. It's an alpha machine. So it's for helium radio th radiotherapy. And you see, uh, you see the characteristic uh, octopole-like field profile. This is the focusing quad. This is the defocusing quad. And here you see the tunes. And I I've lied to you a bit because I actually take a third point because otherwise you get a, the Taylor polynomials oscillate and you actually have to make them well behaved. Here you see three zeros because it's an octopole field and I actually can flatten. This is the isochronous level. Okay, and so this is less than plus or minus a percent, but it oscillates because it's a tailor. And then you come up with the geometry and there, there's your machine. That's what your machine looks like. For a radioisotope machine, I use only a focusing magnet edge crossing. I have a much more better behaved field. And this is a very recent design. And this is, um, here you see a very nice flat tune and the tune is in, is, is per unit cell. It's in terms of two pi. So that quarter means I've got very close to 90 degree per cell in both the horizontal and the vertical. That's a very stable machine design. This is the isochronous level. The isochronous is, it's isochronous or the rotational time is constant to one part in a million. Now your steel isn't that good because you shim it in a normal machine, but this will allow you to test it in your accelerate uh, your very sophisticated acceleration codes. Now here are the differences. Here is I need to start winding down. I've got five more minutes. This is what we first did. This is Emma. This was built in Darisbury in the UK. It was done with the linear fields, very simple approximations, no nonlinear fields. So you could solve it by hand if you wanted to. I actually solved in the Mathematica notebook, but I used find root. And what you do is you find that find root is not, is very limiting. So when you started going to a little bit more ice, when you wanted to go to something that was um, more nonlinear and something much more practical, I mean, no one would, no commercial device, no commercial machine would look like that. That is impossible. So then we started designing isochronous 
machines with the minimizer and with all of these sophisticated equations. And what I ended up with is that I could accelerate all ions with a charge to mass of about a half. And these are important for nuclear security. You can do interrogation and radiography when you use an ion machine. So ion machines are not normal. They're just, there are any compact ion cyclotrons because they're difficult to design. And, but you can, what you can do is you can detect with an ion, you can make, hit a target, make gamma rays and make neutrons. And what happens is when you probe cargo with it, the special nuclear materials will respond. They'll pair produce, they'll produce delayed neutrons if you've got uh, fission. And so you can detect actually nuclear, you can do plutonium or uranium if you actually use this type of machine, okay? Isotope production, this is huge. The isotopes are just, they're all over there. Um, we can make a number of rare isotopes that are currently rare, such as actinium and astatine for uh, radio immunotherapy, radiobiology, okay. So this is what was designed with Mathematica. And so this is most recent. It is very likely we are going to build this actually. And here you see an actual cargo scanning. This is a portable machine. You would load it onto the back of a truck. Okay. You can also make a cocktail of ions in this machine. And this is a very interesting thing. You can make a multi-species ion beam if they have the same charge to mass ratio. So my most, I need to wind this up, but my most, what I'm currently very motivated in is something called flash radiotherapy. And this is a groundbreaking modality in cancer treatment. I have never seen anything like it. And I work with a lot of the therapy uh, people. What it is, is an acute dose um, delivered in a flash radiation. It's almost like dropping a nuclear bomb off beside you without the shock wave or without the, um, the heat. It is, if you delivered it slowly, you would have necrosis of your tissues. You, you would eventually die. But flash targets the radiobiology of tumors and the normal tissues do not respond on this time scale. Um, the theory, it's related to oxygen depletion because oxygen, the particle flash beam depletes the oxygen in normal tissues and they can't form oxygen free radicals. They can't, they can't attack the DNA structure. But the tumor is already hypoxic. It already doesn't have a lot of oxygen. So it's, it sees the full force of the radiation. And they've seen complete remission and incurable and metastasized cancers in preclinical trials. Very notable case was a, was a T-cell lymphoma, complete remission. And he'd had multiple treatments of, of normal radiotherapy. But this requires state-of-the-art accelerator technologies. Um, you can do electrons as you can observe flash has most been most frequently observed with high energy electrons, but we have problems with high energy electrons and I need to wind it down to let people ask questions. This is, this is a 150 MeV machine at Cornell. With the mathematical designs, it's about 30 meters across. I can make it a third the size and make a CW high energy electron beam for flash. And most recently, Lee, we are going to make a flash capable heavy ion therapy machine in Waco. And this, this, is, this is a facility that is currently funded for engineering and design. And that is what I am working on. It is sort of half the size of the Heidelberg ion therapy synchrotron, but it is also flash capable. So I think that I need to wind up. I probably have time for one or two questions and I have lost my ability to check my questions if someone, if, um, Andy, if you want to read me a question. Hi, Carol. Uh, I sent Hi. you, uh, Chase had a long, uh, fairly long question uh, sent in the chat. I, I sent it to you over the Zoom chat. It might be easier for you to read. Um, the main thing was, uh, he says, when you reconcile the projected design with actual field measurements from the device, do you work backwards to see if there is a match with design using nonlinear model fit to fit the measurement data to the expected form? So that's an extremely excellent question. What I do is I give a field map. I produce a field map with all of this. I actually send it off to a very sophisticated code from Michigan State called Cozy Infinity. I said, this is the magnet I want. This is the field profile I want. And they give me a realistic field map. That gets turned over to a magnet designer for Opera Tosca. And then he designs it when a full ANSYS analysis. 
Um, and then it's usually, there's usually a few iterations because the magnet design is, is going to, you know, you got to put prim coils, you got to do a little bit of edge shimming. It'll come back a little bit different. And so there is some iteration. And the final product is just like a cyclotron. You the steel is only good to 10 to the minus three. Uh, and so you end up shimming, you measure each orbit and shim it to the required level. But it is still, there is an, there's a little bit of an iteration, but this is, it is very fast actually. In other words, I can correct, when my magnet designer comes back and tells me, we're a little bit off, can you change this a little bit? I come back and I correct, I correct it. I add a different constraint in the mathematic and we go back through and, and generate him a different field map. So that's, that's about it. And I actually finished on time, which is unusual for me. Say so we have uh, time for probably one more question here. Uh, this is from Boris. He asks, how is the procedure to start the process until the beam is stable and do you control the magnets? Well, yeah, well, this is a fixed field. So it's very much like a cyclotron. So you start it up by measuring the field. You do, you measure, it's a very complex process of field measurements, but a, a fixed field machine is just amazing. Um, it's more of a turnkey system. A synchrotron is much more difficult to getting the frequent, the, the change in frequency to match the orbital control. So yes, you, you do control the magnets and you do have trim coils, but I think this is to a large extent, it's very cyclotron-like. So that's probably all the time we have. Um, is there yeah. a, a great way for people to reach you if they do have further questions? Well, I, I can post my, uh, you can reach me with my FNAL email. I think it's on my profile. Is it on my profile? I'm not sure. Is, is that would be on the path of the profile? I, I can probably list, I can figure it in a chat. I can probably list it in the path of it somewhere. Okay. If you want to put that in the path of the chat field for your talk, that'd probably be ideal. Okay. All right. Well, I, I think that's, that's right. all the Thank time you. we have. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much, Carol.